The Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, commonly known as the Second Vatican Council or Vatican II, addressed relations between the Catholic Church and the modern world. The Council, through the Holy See, was formally opened under the pontificate of Pope John XXIII on the 11th of October 1962 and was closed under Pope Paul VI on the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception on 8 December 1965. Several changes resulted from the Council, including the renewal of consecrated life with a revised charism, ecumenical efforts towards dialogue with other religions, and the universal call to holiness, which according to Pope Paul VI was the most characteristic and ultimate purpose of the teachings of the Council." According to Pope Benedict XVI, the most important and essential message of the Council is, "...the Paschal mystery is the center of what it is to be Christian and therefore of the Christian life, the Christian year, the Christian seasons." Other changes which followed the Council included the widespread use of vernacular languages in the Mass instead of Latin, the subtle disuse of ornate clerical regalia, the revision of Eucharistic prayers, the abbreviation of the liturgical calendar, the ability to celebrate the Mass versus Populum with the officiant facing the congregation, as well as ad orientum facing the East and the crucifix, and modern aesthetic changes encompassing contemporary Catholic liturgical music and artwork. Many of these changes remain divisive among the Catholic faithful. Of those who took part in the Council's opening session, four have become popes Cardinal Giovanni Battista Montini, who on succeeding John XXIII took the name Pope Paul VI, Bishop Albino Lucini, the future Pope John Paul I, Bishop Carol Washtilla, who became Pope John Paul II, and Joseph Ratzinger, present as a theological consultant, who became Pope Benedict XVI. In the 1950s, theological and biblical studies in the Catholic Church had had begun to sway away from the neo-scholasticism and biblical literalism which a reaction to Catholic modernism had enforced since the First Vatican Council. This shift could be seen in theologians such as Karl Rahner, Michael Herbert, and John Courtney Murray who looked to integrate modern human experience with church principles based on Jesus Christ, as well as others such as Eve Conger, Joseph Ratzinger and Henri de Lubac, who looked to an accurate understanding of Scripture and the early church fathers as a source of renewal resourcement. At the same time, the world's bishops faced challenges driven by political, social, economic, and technological change. Some of these bishops sought new ways of addressing those challenges. The First Vatican Council had been held nearly a century before but had been cut short in 1870 when the Italian army entered the city of Rome at the end of Italian unification. As a result, only deliberations on the role of the papacy and the congruent relationship of faith and reason were completed, with examination of pastoral issues concerning the direction of the Church left unaddressed. Pope John XXIII, however, gave notice of his intention to convene the Council on 25 January 1959, less than three months after his election in October 1958. This sudden announcement, which caught the Curia by surprise, caused little initial official comment from Church insiders. Reaction to the announcement was widespread and largely positive from both religious and secular leaders outside the Catholic Church, and the Council was formally summoned by the Apostolic Constitution Humanae Salutis on 25 December 1961. In various discussions before the Council convened, John XXIII said that it was time to "...open the windows of the Church and let in some fresh air." He invited other Christians outside the Catholic Church to send observers to the Council. Acceptances came from both the Eastern Orthodox Church and Protestant denominations as internal observers, but these observers did not cast votes in the approbation of the conciliar documents. Chronology Preparation Pope John XXIII's announcement on 25 January 1959 of his intention to call a general council came as a surprise even to the cardinals present. The pontiff pre announced the council under a full moon when the faithful with their candlelights gathered in St. Peter's Square and jokingly noted about the brightness of the moon. He had tested the idea only ten days before with one of them, his Cardinal Secretary of State Domenico Tardini, who gave enthusiastic support to the idea. Although the Pope later said the idea came to him in a flash in his conversation with Tardini, two cardinals had earlier attempted to interest him in the idea. 
They were two of the most conservative, Ernesto Ruffini and Alfredo Ottaviani, who had already in 1948 proposed the idea to Pope Pius XII and who put it before John XXIII on 27 October 1958. Actual preparations for the Council took more than two years, and included work from ten specialized commissions, people for mass media and Christian unity, and a central commission for overall coordination. These groups, composed mostly of members of the Roman Curia, produced 987 proposed constituting sessions, making it the largest gathering in any council in church history. This compares to Vatican I, where 737 attended, mostly from Europe. Attendance varied in later sessions from 2100 to over 2300. In addition, a varying number of periti, Latin experts, were available for theological consultation a group that turned out to have a major influence as the Council went forward. Seventeen Orthodox churches and Protestant denominations sent observers. More than three dozen representatives of other Christian communities were present at the opening session, and the number grew to nearly 100 by the end of the Fourth Council sessions. Topic. Opening Topic. Pope John XXIII opened the Council on of October 1962 in a public session and read the declaration Gaudet Mater Ecclesia before the Council Fathers. What is needed at the present time is a new enthusiasm, a new joy and serenity of mind in the unreserved acceptance by all of the entire Christian faith, without forfeiting that accuracy and precision in its presentation which characterized the proceedings of the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council. What is needed, and what everyone imbued with a truly Christian, Catholic and apostolic spirit craves today, is that this doctrine shall be more widely known, more deeply understood, and more penetrating in its effects on men's moral lives. What is needed is that this certain and immutable doctrine, to which the faithful owe obedience, be studied afresh and reformulated in contemporary terms. For this deposit of faith, or truths which are contained in our time honored teaching is one thing, the manner in which these truths are set forth with their meaning preserved intact is something else. Rincali, Angelo Giuseppe. Opening Address. Council, Rome, it. The 13th of October 1962 marked the initial working session of the Council. That day's agenda included the election for members of the ten conciliar commissions. Each would have 16 elected and 8 appointed members, and were expected to do most of the work of the Council. It had been expected that the members of the preparatory commissions, where the Curia was heavily represented, would be confirmed as the majorities on the conciliar commissions. Senior French Cardinal Achille Leonard addressed the Council, saying that the bishops could not intelligently vote for strangers. He asked that the vote be postponed to give all the bishops a chance to draw up their own lists. German Cardinal Joseph Frings seconded that proposal, and the vote was postponed. The first meeting of the Council adjourned after only 15 minutes. Topic. Commissions Topic. The bishops met to discuss the membership of the commissions, along with other issues, both in national and regional groups, as well as in gatherings that were more informal. The schemata Latin for drafts from the preparatory sessions were thrown out, and new ones were created. When the Council met on 16 October 1962, a new slate of Commission members was presented and approved by the Council. One important change was a significant increase in membership from Central and Northern Europe. Instead of countries such as Spain or Italy, more than 100 bishops from Africa, Asia, and Latin America were Dutch or Belgian and tended to associate with the bishops from those countries. These groups were led by Cardinals Bernardus Johannes Alfrink of the Netherlands and Leo Swenens of Belgium. Eleven commissions and three secretariats were established, with their respective presidents. De Doctrina Fide et Morum Commission, Alfredo Ottaviani. De Episcopus et Dioecesium Regimine Commission, Paolo Morella. De Ecclesis Orientalibus Commission, Amleto Giovanni Sacognani. De Sacramentorum Disciplina Commission, Benedetto Aloisi Masella. De Disciplina Clary et Populi Christiani Commission, Pietro Seriacci. De Religiosis Commission, Ildebrando Antoniuti. De Sacra Liturgia Commission, Arcadio Loreona. De Missionibus Commission, Gregorio Pietro XV Agagenian. De Seminaries, De Studies, et De Education Catholica Commission, Giuseppe Pizzardo. 
De Fidelium Apostolatu Commission and Descriptus Prelo Edendis et De Spectaculis Moderandis Secretariat, Fernando Cento Technical and Organizational Commission, Gustavo Testa Ad Christianorum Unitatum Fovindam Secretariat, Augustin B. Administrative Secretariat, Alberto Di Giorio Issues <inaudible> 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 After adjournment on 8 December, work began on preparations for the sessions scheduled for 1963. These preparations, however, were halted upon the death of Pope John XXIII on 3 June 1963, since an ecumenical council is automatically interrupted and suspended upon the death of the Pope who convened it, until the next Pope orders the council to be continued or dissolved. Pope Paul VI was elected on 21 June 1963 and immediately announced that the Council would continue. Second period, 1963 In the months prior to the second period, Pope Paul VI worked to correct some of the problems of organization and procedure that had been discovered during the first period. This included inviting additional lay Catholic and non-Catholic observers, reducing the number of proposed schemata to 17 which were made more general, in keeping with the pastoral nature of the Council and later eliminating the requirement of secrecy surrounding general sessions. Pope Paul's opening address on 29 September 1963 stressed the pastoral nature of the Council, and set out four purposes for it. To define more fully the nature of the Church and the role of the bishop. To renew the Church. To restore unity among all Christians, including seeking pardon for Catholic contributions to separation. And to start a dialogue with the contemporary world. During this period, the bishops approved the Constitution on the Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, and the Decree on Social Communication, Inter Marifica. Work went forward with the schemata on the Church, bishops and dioceses, and ecumenism. On 8 November 1963, Joseph Frings criticized the Holy Office, and drew an articulate and impassioned defense by its secretary, Alfredo Ottaviani. This exchange is often considered the most dramatic of the Council. Cardinal Frings' theological advisor was the young Joseph Ratzinger, who would later as a cardinal head the same department of the Holy See, and from 2005 to 13 reign as Pope Benedict XVI. The second period ended on 4 December. Topic. Third period, 1964 Topic. In the time between the second and third periods, the proposed schemata were further revised on the basis of comments from the Council Fathers. A number of topics were reduced to statements of fundamental propositions that could gain approval during the third period, with post-conciliar commissions handling implementation of these measures. At the end of the second period, Cardinal Leo Joseph Swenens of Belgium had asked the other bishops, "'Why are we even discussing the reality of the Church when half of the Church is not even represented here?' referring to women. In response, fifteen women were appointed as auditors in September 1964. Eventually twenty-three women were auditors at the Second Vatican Council, including ten women religious. The auditors had no official role in the deliberations, although they attended the meetings of subcommittees working on council documents, particularly texts that dealt with the laity. They also met together on a weekly basis to read draft documents and comment on them. During the third period, which began on 14 September 1964, the council fathers worked through a large volume of proposals. Schemata on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, the official view on Protestant and Eastern Orthodox separated brethren, the Eastern Rite Churches Orientalium Ecclesiarum, and the dogmatic constitution of the Church Lumen Gentium were approved and promulgated by the Pope. Schemata on the life and ministry of priests and the missionary activity of the Church were rejected and sent back to commissions for complete rewriting. Work continued on the remaining schemata, in particular those on the Church in the modern world and religious freedom. There was controversy over revisions of the decree on religious freedom and the failure to vote on it during the third period, but Pope Paul promised that this schema would be the first to be reviewed in the next period. Pope Paul closed the third period on 21 November by announcing a change in the Eucharistic fast and formally reaffirming Mary as Mother of the Church. Topic. Fourth period, 1965 
Topic 11 schemata remained unfinished at the end of the third period, and commissions worked to give them their final form. Schema 13, on the Church in the Modern World, was revised by a commission that worked with the assistance of laymen. Pope Paul VI opened the last period of the Council on 14 September 1965 with the establishment of the Synod of Bishops. This more permanent structure was intended to preserve close cooperation of the bishops with the Pope after the Council. The first business of the fourth period was the consideration of the decree on religious freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, one of the more controversial of the conciliar documents. The vote was 1,997 for to 224 against, a margin that widened even further by the time the bishops finally signed the decree. The principal work of the other part of the period was work on three documents, all of which were approved by the Council Fathers. The lengthened and revised pastoral constitution on the Church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, was followed by decrees on missionary activity, ad gentis and the ministry and life of priests, presbyterorum ordinis. The Council also gave final approval to other documents that had been considered in earlier sessions. They included the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation Dei Verbum, decrees on the pastoral office of bishops Christus Dominus, the life of persons in religious orders expanded and modified from earlier sessions, finally titled Perfecti Caritatis, Education for the Priesthood Optidum Totius, Christian Education Gravissimum Educationis, and the role of the laity Apostolicam Actuositatum. One of the more controversial documents was Nostra Aetate, which stated that the Jews of the time of Christ, taken indiscriminately, and all Jews today are no more responsible for the death of Christ than Christians. True, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ, still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews, without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jews of today. Although the Church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. All should see to it, then, that in catechetical work or in the preaching of the Word of God they do not teach anything that does not conform to the truth of the Gospel and the Spirit of Christ. Furthermore, in her rejection of every persecution against any man, the Church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews and moved not by political reasons but by the Gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of antisemitism, directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. A major event of the final days of the Council was the act of Pope Paul and Orthodox Patriarch Athenagoras of a joint expression of regret for many of the past actions that had led up to the Great Schism between the Western and Eastern Churches. The old story of the Samaritan has been the model of the spirituality of the Council. Paul VI, Address, 7 December, on 8 December, the Council was formally closed, with the bishops professing their obedience to the Council's decrees. To help carry forward the work of the Council, Pope Paul had earlier formed a papal commission for the media of social communication to assist bishops with the pastoral use of these media, declared a jubilee from 1 January to 26 May 1966 later extended to 8 December 1966 to urge all Catholics to study and accept the decisions of the Council and apply them in spiritual renewal. Changed in 1965 the title and procedures of the Holy Office, giving it the name of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, as well as the titles and competences of other departments of the Roman Curia. Made permanent the secretariats for the promotion of Christian unity, for non-Christian religions, and for non-believers. <laughs> Key content and issues Topic. Liturgy Topic. The first matter covered by the Council was the liturgy, to emphasize the primacy of God and the primacy of adoration, according to Pope Benedict XVI. He said that the most important essential idea of the Council itself is Paschal Mystery Christ's Passion, Death and Resurrection as the center of what it is to be Christian and therefore of the Christian life, the Christian year, the Christian seasons, expressed in Eastertide and on Sunday which is always the day of the Resurrection. Quote, Thus, the liturgy, especially the Eucharist, which makes the Paschal Mystery present, is the summit toward which the activity of the Church is directed, at the same time it is the font from which all her power flows. The matter that had the most immediate effect on the lives of individual Catholics, was the revision of the liturgy. 
The central idea was that there ought to be lay participation in the liturgy which means they take part fully aware of what they are doing, actively engaged in the rite, and enriched by its effects, SC 11. In the mid-1960s, permissions were granted to celebrate most of the Mass in vernacular languages, including the canon from 1967 onwards. The amount of scripture read during Mass was greatly expanded, through the introduction of multiple-year lectionaries. Neither the Second Vatican Council nor the subsequent revision of the Roman Missal abolished Latin as the liturgical language of the Roman Rite. The official text of the Roman Missal, on which translations into vernacular languages are to be based, continues to be in Latin and it can still be used in the celebration. Topic: <laughs> Ecclesiology. Topic: the dogmatic constitution on the Church produced by the Council is entitled Lumen Gentium. In its first chapter, titled, The Mystery of the Church, is the statement that, the sole Church of Christ which in the Creed we profess to be one, holy, Catholic and apostolic, which our Saviour, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter to shepherd, and him and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as, the pillar and mainstay of the truth. This Church, constituted and organized as a society in the present world, subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him Lumen Gentium, 8. The document adds, "...nevertheless, many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside its visible confines." The other characteristics of that period were described by Belgian Bishop Émile Joseph de Smedt as "...legalism," and "...clericalism." in what has been described as one of the most dramatic moments of Vatican II. According to Pope Paul VI, the most characteristic and ultimate purpose of the teachings of the Council is the universal call to holiness. John Paul II calls this an intrinsic and essential aspect of the Council Fathers teaching on the Church. All the faithful of Christ of whatever rank or status, are called to the fullness of the Christian life and to the perfection of charity, by this holiness as such a more human manner of living is promoted in this earthly society. Lumen Gentium, 40, in his plan for the new millennium, Novo Millennio Iniente, John Paul II said that, "...all pastoral initiatives must be set in relation to holiness," as the first priority of the Church. Scripture and Divine Revelation Topic. The Council sought to revive the central role of Scripture in the theological and devotional life of the Church, building upon the work of earlier popes in crafting a modern approach to scriptural analysis and interpretation. A new approach to interpretation was approved by the bishops. The Church was to continue to provide versions of the Bible in the mother tongues of the faithful, and both clergy and laity were to continue to make Bible study a central part of their lives. This affirmed the importance of sacred scripture as attested by Providentissimus Deus by Pope Leo XIII and the writings of the saints, doctors, and popes throughout church history but also approved historically conditioned interpretation of scripture as presented in Pius XII's 1943 encyclical Divino Afflante Spiritu. Topic. Bishops. The role of the bishops was brought into renewed prominence, especially when seen collectively, as a college that has succeeded to that of the apostles in teaching and governing the church. This college was headed by the pope. Objections to the council the questioning of the nature of and even validity of the Second Vatican Council continues to be a contending point of rejection and conflict among various religious communities, some of which are not in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. In particular, two schools of thought may be discerned. Various traditionalist Catholics, who claim that the modernizing reforms that resulted both directly or indirectly from the Council consequently brought detrimental effects, heretical acts, and indifference to the customs, beliefs, and pious practices of the Church before 1962. In addition, they say there is a doctrinal contradiction between the Council and earlier papal statements regarding faith, morals and doctrine declared prior to the Council itself. Furthermore, they claim that the Council decentralized the previous notion of Catholic Church's supremacy over other religions while demoralizing its long-standing pious practices of religiosity. 
They assert that, since there were no dogmatic proclamations defined within the documents of the Council, such documents are not infallible and therefore not canonically binding for faithful Roman Catholics, most notably when such conciliar documents give way, as they say, to loose implementation of long-standing upheld Catholic doctrine previously sanctioned by former popes prior to 1962. In light of this, most traditionalist Catholics often exclusively adhere to the 1917 Code of Canon Law. Sedevacantists go beyond this in asserting that after breaking with Catholic tradition and espousing heresy, present popes and on forward cannot legitimately claim the papacy, and therefore it remains vacant, until another papal claimant formally abandons the Vatican II Council and re establishes former traditional norms. Prior to 1962, the most recent edition of 1983 Code of Canon Law states that Catholics may not disregard the teaching of an ecumenical council even if it does not propose such as definitive. Accordingly, it also maintains that the present living Pope alone judges the criterion of membership for being in communio with the Church. The present canon law further articulates, Although not an assent of faith, a religious submission of the intellect and will must be given to a doctrine which the Supreme Pontiff or the College of Bishops declares concerning faith or morals when they exercise the authentic magisterium, even if they do not intend to proclaim it by definitive act, therefore, the Christian faithful are to take care to avoid those things which do not agree with it. <laughs> Legacy in addition to general spiritual guidance, the Second Vatican Council produced very specific recommendations, such as in the document Gaudium et Spes, "...any act of war aimed indiscriminately at the destruction of entire cities of extensive areas along with their population is a crime against God and man himself. It merits unequivocal and unhesitating condemnation." By the spirit of Vatican II is often meant promoting teachings and intentions attributed to the Second Vatican Council in ways not limited to literal readings of its documents, spoken of as the letter of the Council cf. St. Paul's phrase, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The spirit of Vatican II is invoked for a great variety of ideas and attitudes. Bishop John Tong Hun of Hong Kong used it with regard merely to an openness to dialogue with others, saying, we are guided by the spirit of Vatican II, only dialogue and negotiation can solve conflicts." In contrast, Michael Novak described it as a spirit that sometimes soared far beyond the actual, hard-won documents and decisions of Vatican II. It was as though the world or at least the history of the Church were now to be divided into only two periods, pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II. Everything. Pre was then pretty much dismissed, so far as its authority mattered. For the most extreme, to be a Catholic now meant to believe more or less anything one wished to believe, or at least in the sense in which one personally interpreted it. One could be a Catholic. In spirit. One could take Catholic to mean the. Culture. In which one was born, rather than to mean a creed making objective and rigorous demands. One could imagine Rome as a distant and irrelevant anachronism, embarrassment, even adversary. Rome as them. Dei Verbum reads, Therefore, following in the footsteps of the Council of Trent and of the First Vatican Council, this present Council wishes to set forth authentic doctrine on divine revelation and how it is handed on. Vatican II did not deny previous Council's correctness. To mark the 50th anniversary of the beginning of Vatican II, in October 2011, Pope Benedict XVI declared the period from October 2012 to the Solemnity of Christ the King at the end of November 2013 a year of faith as a good opportunity to help people understand that the texts bequeathed by the Council Fathers, in the words of John Paul II, have lost nothing of their value or brilliance. They need to be read correctly, to be widely known and taken to heart as important and normative texts of the magisterium, within the Church's tradition. I feel more than ever in duty bound to point to the Council as the great grace bestowed on the Church in the 20th century, there we find a sure compass by which to take our bearings in the century now beginning. Gallery Topic. Topic. See also. Topic. Central Preparatory Commission. 
Debreu Emmett Topic Notes Topic Topic References Topic Topic Bibliography Topic Alberigo, Giuseppe, Sherry, Matthew 2006, A Brief History of Vatican II, Marinol, Orbis Books, ISBN 1-57075-638-4. Gherardini, Brunero 2011, Il Discorso Mancato The Missing Discourse, Lindau. Hahnenberg, Edward 2007, A Concise Guide to the Documents of Vatican II, City, St. Anthony Messenger Press, ISBN 0-86716-552-9 Harity, J. ed. 1967. "'Vatican Council II' New Catholic Encyclopedia, 14, Faculty of Catholic University of America 1 ed., New York, McGraw-Hill, ISBN 978-0-07-010235-4, OCLC 34184550. Sullivan, Maureen 2002, 101 Questions and Answers on Vatican II, New York, Paulist Press, ISBN 0-8091-4133-7. Topic. Further reading Topic. Topic. Vatican texts Topic. Index to Vatican II texts from the Vatican Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, Holy See, 7 December 1965, retrieved 1 January 2009 Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, Dei Verbum, Holy See, the 18th of November 1965, retrieved the 1st of January 2009. Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, Holy See, the 21st of November 1964, retrieved the 1st of January 2009. Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, Holy See, the 21st of November 1964, retrieved the 1st of January 2009. Declaration on Christian Education, Gravissimum Educationis, Holy See, the 28th of October 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Declaration on the relation of the Church to non-Christian religions, Nostra Aetate, Holy See, the 28th of October 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, Holy See, the 28th of October 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on the Mission Activity of the Church, Ad Gentis, Holy See, the 7th of December 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on the Ministry and Life of Priests, Presbyterorum Ordinis, Holy See, the 7th of December 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on the Apostolate of the Laity, Apostolicam Actuositatum, Holy See, the 18th of November 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on Priestly Training, Optatum Totius, Holy See, the 28th of October 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on the Adaptation and Renewal of Religious Life, Perfecti Caritatis, Holy See, the 28th of October 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree concerning the Pastoral Office of Bishops in the Church, Christus Dominus, Holy See, the 28th of October 1965, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on Ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, Holy See, the 21st of November 1964, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on the Catholic Churches of the Eastern Rite, Orientalium Ecclesiarum, Holy See, the 21st of November 1964, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Decree on the Media of Social Communications, Intermorifica, Holy See, the 4th of December 1963, retrieved the 20th of June 2015. Overview of the Decrees of the Council Vatican II Texts from the Eternal Word Television Network Vatican II Texts from Christus Rex Council Vatican II's Multilingual Opera Omnia 
Conciliaria, 50 years ago today at the Second Vatican Council reporting and original source documents from the Council Speech of Pope Paul VI at the General Audience of 12 January 1966 on the correct interpretation of the Second Vatican Council original text in Italian. Topic. Support Topic. Why was Vatican II needed? Why we need it today, Vatican II, Voice of the Church. Making the true Vatican II our own, Christendom awake. Topic. Criticism Topic. What did the Second Vatican Council do for us, Christendom awake? Gerardini, Brunero, Church Tradition Magisterium, Center for Mediaeval Studies Leonard Boyle, archived from the original on 20 January 2012. Vatican II in the Light of Tradition and Magisterium of the Catholic Church 2011, Sullindol Pastoral del Vaticano II on the Pastoral Nature of Vatican II, an evaluation, Frigento, IT, Center for Mediaeval Studies Leonard Boyle, archived from the original on 5 April 2012. Petition to the Holy Father Benedict XVI for a review of Vatican II, Center for Mediaeval Studies Leonard Boyle, archived from the original on 30 October 2012, retrieved 14 September 2012. Advocates a qualified study of Vatican II in view of a possible reassessment. The Ecumenical Vatican Council II a much-needed discussion, Center for Mediaeval Studies Leonard Boyle, ISBN 9788890177962 Topic. Archived from the original on 30 October 2012, the book was written, "...to stop the conventional hand-clapping and any preconceived interpretation of Vatican II and to open a far-ranging debate on its historical, theological, and dogmatic significance." Gerardini, 2011, p. 48. Tauk, F. R. Raymond. What are Roman Catholics to think of Vatican II? On the doctrinal authority of the Pastoral Council. Modern Problems, Catholic Apologetics. Topic. External links. Topic. Media related to Second Vatican Council at Wikimedia Commons.